Hi everyone, welcome back to Salmon in the Schools. Uh, today we are going to talk about salmon habitat and water quality. Let's get started. So we're going to do a quick review of the previous two lessons, which were um, the salmon life cycle and salmon species. And then we're going to talk about the types of water habitat salmon live in, the three C's of salmon water habitat, what makes for good water habitat other than uh, water quality. And, and we're going to do a couple field investigations of water quality and a habitat survey. So first up, we're going to go through the semen life cycle real quick. I know that we've done this a couple times, so you're all experts by now. Uh, but just to keep it fresh in your mind, we have the first stage as eggs. They're laid in the gravel. And then once they hatch, they're alevin. They've got that yolk sac attached. Once they've used up that yolk sac, they're swimming, they're fried. They're still living in the river, though. And then we've got smolts once they've moved down to the estuary where it's that mix of salt water and fresh water. They get that silver color. They lose those camouflage par marks. They are now smolts. Then once they move out into the bigger Pacific Ocean, we call them ocean adults. They're going to live there for a few years, grow really big. And then they're going to return home to the stream where they were uh, born and they are going to be spawners now. Get those beautiful spawning colors and lay the next generation of salmon when they start that whole cycle all over again. All right, and so the second review is going to be the five species of salmon. And if you guys remember, we used our hands to memorize these to help us uh, remember the five species of Pacific salmon that we have here in Washington. First up, we had thumb for chum. And then we had our pointer finger that you point to your eye, but don't poke your eye out. And that's for sockeye. And then we had our tallest finger, the king of all the fingers, we called it. And king was a nickname for Chinook. And we remember that Chinook was the biggest of all the fish. That's why we call them the king. And then we had our ring finger. And that's where we wear our silver. And silver is a nickname for coho. And then we had our pinky finger. And that is for pink salmon. Okay, what we're talking about today is salmon habitat. And we know that a salmon's habitat is mainly water, but there are actually three types of water, um, three types of water habitats that salmon live in throughout their lives. And a habitat is the environment that hosts a particular species of plant, animal, or other organism. It's their home. So we're gonna turn to page 15 in our salmon science journals and we are going to fill out the blanks as we learn about salmon water habitats. So every creature on earth has a home they live in. Beavers build dams with sticks to live in, bees live in hives, wolves dig dens in the ground. These homes are their habitat and like we just said salmon live in the water, we all know that. Water is their habitat. Without that they would die. And so, like I said a little bit ago, salmon live in three water habitats throughout their life cycle. And so they begin their lives in fresh water. We're going to write that down in our journals. <clears throat> and fresh water would be things like streams and lakes. And there are several life stages that live in that fresh water, water habitat. And that would be our eggs, our alevin, and our fry. And then I'd also probably include uh, spawners in there too. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> but then they live in a second habitat, that mixed habitat of salt water and fresh water that we call uh, the estuary habitat. And so the main life stage that lives there is going to be our smolts. They're in that transition phase where they're not quite ready to be in the ocean, but they're done with living in the river. And then our third water habitat for salmon, we're going to write all three of these down, uh, is the ocean. And this is where our ocean adults are going to live so that they can grow really big before they return home. So maybe our page looks something like this, just a few words, freshwater, estuary, and ocean. No big deal. 
So now we're going to talk a little bit about the three C's of salmon habitat. Salmon need water that is cold, clean, and clear. And cold water can hold more oxygen than warm water because the molecules um, in it are denser. Salmon pull that oxygen out of the water with their gills. Clean water is also really important because pollutants and trash can injure or kill salmon. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the things that we would consider pollution um, in the coming slides. And then we've got clear water. Clear water allows salmon to breathe without being smothered. Just like smoke makes it hard for us to breathe, dirt in the water clogs salmon's gills so they can't breathe. So we're going to turn to page 16 of our salmon science journals, and we're going to fill in blanks to learn what makes for good salmon habitat. We're going to start in the upper left box and work clockwise around the image. First, we have trees. Trees shade the river and keep the water cold, which we know salmon really like cold water, not warm water. Next, we've got riffles. Uh, riffles are water moving over rocks and they put oxygen into the water. We're going to see some examples of what a riffle looks like in our virtual habitat survey uh, later in the, the lesson today. Next we've got tree roots and these roots hold soil in the riverbank so it doesn't wash into the water and smother the fish like we talked about with the smoke making it hard for us to breathe, dirt makes it hard for the fish to breathe. And then we've got dead trees. So trees in all forms are amazing for salmon, but the dead trees, they fall into the river and provide shelter for fish to hide in. We talked <clears throat> a little bit about that previously, how little fish need places to hide. Next up, we've got pools. Pools are kind of the opposite of riffles, but they're also equally important because they provide a resting place for our fish. Uh, they can't swim like their hardest 24-7. If you wanted to run at your full speed 24-7, you'd have a really difficult time. You'd need to take little breaks. So it's the same thing for fish. They need a smaller, um, slower section of the river to take a break. And lastly, we have gravel. Gravel is really important for salmon because the adults use it to build those nests, those reds but the gravel can't be too big or they can't move it with their tails when they're digging. And it also can't be too small because then it would smother the eggs when they're in there incubating. So it has to be kind of like that Goldilocks gravel of just the right size. So our page should look something like this now, trees, ripples, tree roots, uh, dead trees, pools, and gravel. So we're going to turn to page 17 of our salmon science journals and we're going to fill out the blanks about the three C's of salmon water habitat. I mentioned these before, but we're really going to talk about them more now. So we're going to talk a little bit more about each of these three C's of salmon water habitat. They are cold, clean, and clear water. So first up, we're gonna write those down on page 17 in the lines that all start with C, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about each of these parameters here. So temperature is the first C of salmon water habitat because it's one of the most critical components. Uh, cold water species like salmon need temperatures that range from 40 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, anything warmer, and it stresses them and can be lethal. Their metabolism and immune system is not made to handle hot temperatures, anything colder, and their growth is limited. So they can't reach their full potential. So we're going to write cold on the next blank line that, because um, cold water can hold more oxygen than warm water because the molecules are denser and salmon pull that oxygen out of the water with the gills. So what would happen if we cut down all of these trees along this river? Would the water be warmer or colder? It would probably be warmer with all, without all that shade that the trees provide. And since we know that warmer water holds less oxygen, this would be less ideal habitat for salmon uh, without these trees here to provide that cold water. 
Okay, clean water is our second C of salmon water habitat. And we're gonna start by talking about pH when we talk about clean water. Um, salmon prefer a neutral pH, similar to distilled water. pH is percent hydrogen. And that tells you how acidic or alkaline a substance is. And it's important to keep track of pH in our tanks. If it's too low or too high, it may be due to bacteria or algae growing uh, and that can alter those levels. And we really need to make sure that it's not at a lethal level for salmon. So now what would change the pH of a stream? Oftentimes it's due to pollutants and phosphates and nitrates are the most common pollutant uh, nutrients. They're chemicals that plants need for growth. Uh, so they're, they're natural occurring chemicals, but too much of them in water can hurt fish. <clears throat> too much nitrate in the water makes it difficult for a fish's red blood cells to carry enough oxygen to their tissues. And then too much phosphate or nitrate can also start a chain reaction with algae because they grow faster with those excess nutrients. And then bacteria that eat the algae come in and eat a bunch, but then they die when they've used up all of that algae food source. And when the bacteria are decomposing, that decomposition, decomposition process uses up oxygen in the water, and that leaves no oxygen left for salmon. This is called eutrophication. So how do pollutants get in the water? The main sources of pollutants are runoff waste from <clears throat> barnyard animals or pets, as well as sewage leaks. Um, so you might wanna be writing this down in your, your science journal, so there's spots for all of this. Um, another soy source of pollution in streams would be oil leaks from cars, and then also overuse of fertilizers and pesticides. Those end up in streams. And then even soaps when we wash our car gets rinsed down into storm drains, which then lead to uh, salmon streams. The third C of salmon water habitat is clear water. And so and I know we've said this a few times, but salmon really, really need that uh, clear water that's free of dirt. Excess soil particles can clog fish gills making it hard to extract oxygen from the water, like how that smoke from wildfire makes it hard for us to breathe. Sediment in water also makes it hard for salmon to see the insects that they hunt for food. They're visual feeders. So <clears throat> a third reason uh, clear water is important for salmon is that when they are the egg stage in the gravel, if they get covered by fine sediment, they'll get suffocated. They can't breathe if they're completely covered by tiny, tiny dirt particles. So to measure clear water, uh, we look for something called turbidity. And this is a visual uh, test of how clear or cloudy a water sample is. Oh, and then tree roots are one of the ways that we uh, help keep water clear. They hold back um, the soil so that less dirt ends up in the river and so the water is clearer or less turbid. Okay, so now maybe our page looks something like this. Uh, we've got cold, clean, clear, and we've got some examples of pollutants. <clears throat> There's one more line there. So if you can think of one more stream pollutant to add to our list, that would be amazing. Since fish have to live in water 24 seven, we probably want to know whether that water is healthy for them. So we're going to turn to page 18 in our science journals now to learn about water quality. Uh, I know some of you have done previous water quality events, so this may be a bit of review, but a lot of you probably haven't. So we're just going to do a real quick field investigation. Um, we're going to take a virtual visit to a local stream, and you're going to take notes on some water quality test results. All right, it's early February. We are going to test the water quality out here at Kennedy Creek. So first things first, I have to get a water sample. Ooh. 
That is cold. Next up, we're gonna take a water temperature reading and we're gonna do it in degrees Celsius. This water is really cold. We're at 6.6 .6 degrees Celsius. So in Fahrenheit, that would be 43.9 degrees. Our first test is going to be for dissolved oxygen. So we're gonna take our sample vial here, or a test vial, and we're going to submerge it in our sample water. And it's going to be completely overflowing. We don't want any extra oxygen from the air in there, just the oxygen from the water. And we're going to put two of these tablets in there and this will make it overflow even more. Let's see if I can do this one-handed. Probably not. Oops. And we're gonna tilt this back and forth. We're gonna do this until the tablets have completely disintegrated. Okay, that took about five minutes, so our tablets are dissolved. We're gonna let this sit for another five minutes, and so we're gonna go on to our other tests before we read our results for dissolved oxygen. The next test we're gonna look at is turbidity. So we are going to compare the images on the left to the disc, the secchi disc is what we call that, that black and white disc at the bottom there, that's called a secchi disc. So our disc at the bottom of our sample water looks like that. And these are our options. And I'd say it most closely matches the 40 JTU uh, example. Not quite as clear as a zero JTU, uh, but definitely not the 100. So we're gonna call it 40. Next up, we'll be testing for phosphate. So we're gonna fill our test tube up to the 10 milliliter line, and then we are going to add one of the phosphorus test tabs. Yeah, that's about at that 10 milliliter line. So we're gonna add one of our test tabs. There's our tab. Oh my gosh, get in. Okay, in it goes, and then we are going to put the cap on and invert it like we did with the dissolved oxygen until the tablet has disintegrated, and then we're going to have to wait another five minutes on that one also. Next up is nitrate. We're going to fill our test tube to the five milliliter line and then add one of our nitrate CTA uh, test tab. Oh, perfect. There we go, that's right at the five milliliter line. So let's add our tablet. All right, we've got our tablet. Oh no, in it goes. And we're gonna cap this, and then we're going to uh, invert it for two minutes to get the tablet to disintegrate. Our last test is going to be pH, so we're going to fill our test tube up to the 10 milliliter line. All right, and we're going to add one of the uh, pH test tabs. Get in there. We're going to cap it. And then we're going to mix it, inverting it like we did for all of the other samples. But this one we get to uh, read immediately after the test tab has dissolved. All right, it's been about five minutes. We're gonna read our test results. So this was our dissolved oxygen. And if I compare it to the colors we've got here, it's rather dark. So I'm gonna say that it's closest to that eight parts per million for dissolved oxygen. And this test doesn't go any higher than eight parts per million. I suspect that our water actually has more than this. The next test we did was the phosphate. And it looks like our phosphate sample is a very, very, very light blue. Um, I don't know if I would even call it the one part per million. 
it's not quite zero, but maybe I would call it 0 0.5 parts per million. All right, so we need to remove our nitrate uh, test tube from the protective sleeve because uh, these tablets are, they will interact with UV light, which will make our reading invalid. So that's why we put it in this protective sleeve. So let's look at our color here. For nitrate, hmm, it's even a little bit lighter than our five parts per million. So I might call this the 2.5 parts per million. So it's not quite even as dark as that. It's pretty light. So yeah, let's call it 2.5 parts per million. Our last test to read is our pH. And it's kind of a light green color. I'd say it's probably closest to the seven example here. So we're gonna call our pH 7.0. Our sheets should look something like this now. Um, I'll talk about the abbreviations first real quick. We've got uh, JTU and PPM. JTU uh, for our um, turbidity stands for Jackson Turbidity Units. The scientist who created this test was named Jackson, so he named it after himself. And then we've got PPM. That stands for parts per million. For example, if your test um, best matched two parts per million on the chart, that means that in every one million molecules in your water sample, two of those molecules were phosphate um, or nitrate or dissolved oxygen, since they're also measured in parts per million. So what do we think? Uh, was the water quality here at Kennedy Creek mostly excellent, good, okay, or unhealthy for salmon? Uh, looking at my results here, looks like it was a mix of excellent and good. So this would likely be a pretty good uh, water habitat for salmon to live in. I, I feel like these are pretty good results. We're going to uh, turn to page 19 because it's not just the water that's important for salmon to survive. We're going to visit, uh, do another Kennedy Creek uh, visit in the next video and fill out a stream habitat survey sheet together. We're going to mark an X next to each habitat feature that we observe at the stream that would make for good salmon habitat in addition to uh, that good water quality that we just talked about. Now that we have looked at the water quality, we're going to assess the habitat available to salmon here at Kennedy Creek. So we're gonna look at a bunch of different parameters that are in your science journals and we're gonna make an X next to each habitat feature that we observe here at this specific stream. We're not gonna be able to check everything off because no stream is gonna have every single one of these, but Kennedy Creek is gonna have a lot of them. So as we go through and look at some video of the creek here, we're gonna check these off. First up, we're gonna look for shade. I know it's winter, so the trees aren't leafed out yet, but we can tell that there are a lot of trees here around Kennedy Creek. So we're gonna make an X next to shade. There's lots of shade. And then we're also gonna make an X next to the next line, lots of trees, because there are so many trees here. I don't see any beaver dams, so we're not gonna make an X next to that, but I do see places to hide. All of these tree roots here, these are great places for fish to hide. This log jam here would also make an amazing place for little fish to hide in there. We also want the stream to kind of meander and curve. So there's lots of that going on at Kennedy Creek. It's not just a channelized ditch. There's lots of different habitat here. We're also gonna make an X next to consistent water because there's a lot of good flow here, at least during the winter time. I'm not seeing any big boulders. Probably the biggest rocks I'm seeing are maybe the size of an orange. So I think we're gonna leave boulders blank, but I do see lots of gravel. So the one right below boulders, all of this is fantastic gravel. And this is what our salmon are looking for to spawn in. This is beautiful, beautiful gravel. The next uh, 
line we're looking at here is big logs in the river. These logs break up the flow of water and provide a sheltered area for fish to rest. So I'm gonna put an X next to that. There are lots of big logs. The next parameter we're looking for for a healthy salmon stream is food. So I'm just gonna take a quick sample here to see what we have living in the rocks. I don't have my actual server sampler to do this because I can't find it, but I think you might find something if I just put this in there. And we kind of pan for gold. Oh yeah, I see little bugs in there already. Okay. Let's see if I can get, oh, there's one. Do you guys see it? Right there. Oops, another one. These look like little um, mayfly larvae. So we're gonna put an X next to food. Our next line is deep pools. And I'm gonna say yes for deep pools. These provide really important fish habitat, especially in the summer when the flow and the rest of the stream drops. Um, these pools are where a lot of juvenile fish are gonna live all summer long. And then also they're important for the adult salmon when they return because it's a resting place in their long journey. They can come and hang out in that pool with the slow moving water and rest before they have to work hard again to swim upstream. This is what we would call a riffle. We've got some white water up there. It's fast flowing water over some larger rocks. And this incorporates oxygen into our stream. And at the tail out here of that riffle, we come into another pool. So we're gonna check yes for riffles. We're also gonna put an X next to cold water and clean water since we just did our water quality um, sampling and we know that the water is very, very cold. And we also know that it is clear based on our temperature and turbidity readings. The next line is for side channel and I can kind of see one over here. It's really hard to see, but I'm gonna say yes for side channel. So that's just a smaller little section that's connected on both the upstream and downstream end uh, to the main river here. And it provides a little bit different habitat. It's slower, it's shallower and it may provide just a sheltered area where little fish can go, but big fish won't be able to. I haven't really seen much garbage here, so we're gonna say, we're gonna put an X next to no garbage. Pretty good. And also I haven't noticed any dog poop near the stream. Um, there's no nearby farms, so there's not gonna be any fertilizer. Um, our nitrate level is really low, so I don't think there's an issue with fertilizer getting into the stream. So we're gonna put an X next to no fertilizer. Most of the plants uh, on the edge of the stream here at Kennedy Creek are native species. So I'm not seeing a whole lot of invasive species. Uh, so I think we're gonna put an X next to no invasive species. So the next item is culverts. There is one culvert in this system. It's on Fiscus Creek and culverts go underneath roads to allow rivers and streams to pass under them. Sometimes culverts are easy for salmon to swim through, but other times they're not. This one's not terrible. It's pretty filled up with sediment. Uh, it needs to be quite a bit bigger to be ideal. But since there is a culvert on this stream system, we are not going to make an X next to no culverts. We'll leave that blank. And our last item, no man-made dams we get to put an X next, next to that one. There are no dams on the Kennedy Creek system. So maybe our page looks something like this now. Uh, we're going to count up how many items uh, we marked with an X and write that number below. And then we're gonna use that uh, to see kind of what rating we would give our stream. So I got 17, uh, so I would circle the excellent rating. Um, I'd like you to think about the stream habitat survey and write down one thing at the bottom that you would change about this stream to make it better for, for salmon. Um, there are a lot of really great things about it. So there's not a lot of work to be done, but I would take a look at some of the things that we didn't check off to get some ideas. If it was me, I think one thing that I would change uh, would be to replace that culvert 
with a bridge or a much larger culvert to make it easier for a salmon to swim through. So now that we know what kinds of things make for good salmon habitat based on our water quality and habitat survey exercises, um, real quick, I wanted to highlight some of the threats that salmon face while living in rivers. And these things degrade water quality or stream habitat for salmon. First, they have to navigate through human-made barricades like dams, which often completely block their passage. Um, or sometimes they just make it really difficult. They may have fish ladders to assist the salmon, but it's still not as good as if the dam wasn't there. Um, but there's a balance there between providing energy for humans and habitat for salmon. So that's a whole other debate. Um, next, we've got culverts like we just saw. Uh, many of them have really large drops that salmon can't jump up to, um, or the culvert is too small. So the water gets funneled through that small opening, kind of like a fire hose. It's forced through that small opening and it gets really fast, too fast for salmon to swim through. A third threat uh, to salmon would be pollution. Uh, that pollution can kill them. It's really serious. Uh, any, even a small amount of pollution can be very harmful to salmon. Next up would be logging. Uh, logging isn't bad in, in general, but if we take too many trees or trees too close to rivers, uh, we take away that shade and that dirt holding capacity. So the water is going to be warmer and dirtier. And then we've got floods. Floods are a natural occurrence, but when humans build on floodplains, uh, it means the river has nowhere to go when it tops its banks. Naturally, it would be allowed to go there and spread out and, and disperse that flow so it's not all concentrated in one small area. But if it can't go into those areas to disperse the flow, um, the water in that main channel can get too fast. And so the salmon can can't keep up with that sometimes. Uh, lastly, we've got erosion, uh, which brings us back to trees again. Without those tree roots to, uh, to hold the soil in the banks, uh, there's greater erosion. Uh, the banks fall into the river and that adds a lot of dirt, which can clog the salmon's gills. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we can take actions that help to keep the water clean so that salmon have healthy, safe places to live and so that we have you know, healthy, safe water as well. So we can use lawn and garden products that are safe for the environment. Uh, we can not over fertilize our lawn and garden. Uh, that excess doesn't get used by the plants. It just washes through the soil and into the river systems eventually or into the groundwater um, beneath the, the, the water table. Um, we could wash our cars on grass instead of pavement because it'll filter through the grass and the dirt uh, instead of just running directly down the street into storm drains, which lead to rivers. We can pick up uh, pet waste and put it in the garbage every single time. Dog poop is a major source of, uh, of pollution in urban areas. We could buy cleaning products that are free of toxic chemicals. All of these things end up in the water somehow. Um, we could not dump garbage directly in streams, rivers, or oceans. That's a really easy thing to not do. Just take your garbage with you, um, pack it in, pack it out, leave no trace. Uh, let's see, we could also fix oil leaks in our family's cars. Uh, if you have a car and it's leaking oil, you are putting direct pollutants, toxic pollutants into the environment. Uh, so. It's better for you. Your car is going to be happier. It's going to be more efficient uh, and it's better for the environment to just get that fixed. And then something else that we could do is even though we're not throwing trash out into uh, the rivers and, and beaches, other people are. And so if we feel like we can help by picking that trash up, that's always a good thing. I know we've already done a couple of video activities with our virtual site visits, uh, stream surveys, but our last activity for this unit is just a simple word search. Uh, it's on page 20. So whenever you have free time, maybe take a shot at it and see if you can find all of the words. A couple of them are pretty difficult, so we'll see how it goes. But I think 
you guys can probably find most of them. So thanks so much for joining me to learn all about salmon habitat and water quality. And I am excited to see you next time.